we should go ahead. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's kick off the third webinar that we're having. Welcome everyone to this webinar. It is part of Celebrating Financial Inclusion Week. Um, this is a global community effort which is put together by the Center for Financial Inclusion based at Axion in Washington, DC. So Move78, Mariko Braswell, my partner there, and Financial Resilience Australia are so glad to welcome you to this third webinar. Um, the topic that you're discussing today has come up in each of the other webinars as well. Remittances and migrant workers is such an important part of financial inclusion. But before we start um, the day, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this wonderful land that we find ourselves in and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So now I'll hand over to Mariko to kick this webinar off. Thank you so much, Vanita. And a welcome to all the panelists and attendees. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we're thrilled to have you join us for our final webinar this week on remittances in Asia in COVID-19. And what can we do better? Um, with the Pacific being one of the least banked regions in the world and one third of the world's migrant worker population being based here in Asia, you add in a global pandemic and it leads to dire results. Um, the ADB economists recently estimated that the region faces remittance losses from $31.4 billion to $54.3 billion, and that's in USD. So today we'll hear from our pa panelists from their varied perspectives about what the major hurdles and pain points are for the remittances uh, and, and the remittance process right now. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator and my colleague, Jerry Ferguson, um, who's a senior advisor to us. And Jerry has been in financial services for the past 15 plus years um, and has been working with some of the world's largest financial services uh, companies across APAC. Um, he's been applying his knowledge to the tech and banking uh, industry and um, lately to the fintech and digital banking industries. So we thank him and uh, I'll leave it to you. Thank you very Thank you, much. Jerry. Thanks, Mariko. Thank you very much to you as well, Benita, and uh, thanks to all our panelists and audience for joining us this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> it's Friday afternoon where I am. It may be a Friday morning where you're listening to this, so uh, we're going to keep this light and fun and, and have a really um, strong conversation around um, remittances in Asia within the context of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'll get to my illustrious panel in, the, in a minute, which consists of an entrepreneur and economist uh, and an academic, which sounds like the start of a really bad joke, but um, <laughs> hopefully it won't be. So we'll um, we'll try and move through without getting a little too silly. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we we look at, and why we wanted to talk about this topic in particular, as as Mariko highlighted in her opening, there's some really staggering um, numbers that are coming out of the the region as a result of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and I. For me, one of the interesting areas to look at and unpick, which we will do today, is to figure out, you know, what was an issue before COVID-19, what's an issue because of COVID-19, and more importantly, what will the issues be going forward um, off the back of this? And hopefully, you know, when COVID-19 dissipates or, or moves away, then, then we can start to think about those. Um, to set the scene, I want to talk to um, Badri Nairan first. I'm reading a report recently you did, Badri, in... Uh, for the Asian Development Bank. Staggering statistic for me um, that the COVID-19 pandemic threatens the job security of over 91 million international migrants from the Asia and the Pacific region. That is a, a huge number. Um, can you give us a little bit of a, uh, the highlights of the report, what you're seeing and, and what the impact of this pandemic is, is sort of bearing fruit? Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, uh, you know, beyond the numbers, um, uh, what we, uh, broadly, you know, looked at in this report, and what we found was that uh, we uh, we we uh, uh, first modeled the loss, uh, the overall economic losses coming from COVID, and that's mainly because of the economy shrinking overall. So when the economies are shrinking, when the consumption, uh, you know, trade, investment, all these different elements of GDP are shrinking, uh, that's going to affect. Uh, people at large 
and and there is an there is an impact on uh, you know employment and wage income that is very clear and uh, you know uh, a large number of people lose jobs and some people may retain their jobs but have a face a heavy you know cuts in income wage wage income so this is the situation uh, that that you see uh, overall because of covid in the economy and how people at large are affected now taking this specific case of uh, migration uh, what we did was we took this overall uh, slump in the economy global economy and how how this is panning out in two different scenarios we looked at uh, a baseline in fact I, i must say that when we started the study we had a baseline and a pessimistic scenario uh, by the time we finished the study the pessimistic scenario became the baseline scenario <laughs> so and then we had to do another uh, pessimistic scenario so it's 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 kind of quite crazy the way the way you know, things have also dynamically so in the baseline scenario um, which was basically the the pessimistic scenario of a previous report we published with adb that was in may that was on the global economic impact of uh, pandemic in general so that the the that negative scenario there uh, what we said was because of this economic impact Uh, which uh, happens in different countries in the world uh, some migrants uh, you know some people are migrants from with, who belong to countries that are affected a lot and some of them could be migrants who are in the destination countries that are affected a lot and and in both cases they suffer so uh, when the job losses happen in the destination countries in the countries where they live um, Uh, they are in a really difficult situation uh, one because they lose their jobs uh, two um, those who don't lose their jobs they re- re- get their wages reduced and number three they don't have mobility and they typically they live in a higher cost of living kind of country because they 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 typically come from poorer countries for example they may uh, come from bangladesh or you know um uh, 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 Nepal or India, Pakistan, and so on, and they may be living in uh, UAE or Saudi Arabia, and so on, which are you know way which are in higher income countries. So now they are stuck there. They don't have they don't have a job. They don't have their income, and then they are stuck there uh, without being able to go back. So these are mm-hmm. these are the 91 million number that you mentioned. Is these are these that's the number of people who are at risk, and then we found some numbers in the report. You can see. Uh, as to uh, uh, the, the, the one how those uh, the em- the employees are affected the, the migrants are affected secondly because of the the re- the reduction in remittances that they have been repatriating to their home countries yeah. the home countries are being affected and this is probably one of the one of the rare instances in the recent past mm-hmm. where a lot of people who have actually come out of poverty line who have been long um, you know uh, away from poverty line and they've been doing pretty well like kind of middle class ish kind of people uh, they have been brought back to below poverty line and that's a tremendous uh, issue this time and uh, mig- migrants uh, have been forming a major part of that because they left their countries because the income wasn't sufficient and they were making decent living in other con- or decent income in other countries mm-hmm. and now they are uh, they lose that so so basically what we also found in uh, in our study is that the the hard work that we had that has been done over time to reduce poverty uh, we kind of try to plot it over time how much poverty have we reduced within this few months we must we might have gone 3 uh, 4 years backwards and and if you look at the actual extent of poverty reduction that is quite amazing in the last few years we have actually globally have done a pretty good job globally and particularly in asia pacific we done a great job in reducing poverty and uh, a lot of it is being undone now in, in this very short time uh, and uh, I, i think before i conclude i'll uh, uh, for now i'll come back again later but uh, one one another uh, major you know kind of point that we emphasize in our report is that um, assuming that this is a kind of a temporary scenario I mean, how temporary is for everyone to you know guess it's it's not not clear It, it, some of the elements could be permanent so or, or semi permanent they can like restaurants hotels and so on they can uh, they may they may stay closed for longer time uh, now now assuming that uh, a lot of this employee um, the, a lot of these migrants and employees are going to be stranded for a while we expect a lot of uh, effort by both the 
uh, source countries and the destination countries, the countries from where they come from and the countries where they stay. They have to make a lot of efforts, one, to for some income security, give them at least uh, enough to sustain. Uh, second, to repatriate them, bring them back to their homes. Um, and, and, and third, to you know, get them some kind of uh, jobs, basically. So create and create and jobs. And this is possible through a wide range of policy measures, uh, obviously income support, uh, some kind of subsidies to the consumption subsidies and so on. And, uh, and also fiscal stimulus where countries can start doing some infrastructure projects and so on where they can create some employment. And, and boost the economy in, in that way. It can both boost the macro economy and provide jobs for people who are coming back and so on. So I, I think I'll, uh, sorry for the long, uh, you know. No, no, that, that was great, Patrick. But I'll come back again after uh, I have spoke more questions. It's always nice when you're doing some global modeling and a pesky pandemic comes along in the middle of it and completely changes your baseline assumptions. I'm sure that was a... <laughs> Slightly um, annoying for you. Ross, I want to bring you in here. Ross is a, um, a professor of disruptive innovation. Um, I'll ask you a little bit about your, your background, but you've been looking at the, the issue of cross-border payments for a long time now. Um, how much of this is a new issue in terms of the, the struggle around remittances? We know I think we'd all agree on this, this program that it's a, um, an inefficient system at best, but how much of these issues have been around for a while? How much is being shone a light on now because of COVID? Um, what's your sort of take on, on where the, the play was 12 months leading up to this and even longer before? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jerry. Um, well, even going back seven or eight years, this was a big problem, right? This has been a big problem for a long time. It was getting worse in the last few years because basically remittances are a very important source of income. But I'm coming to you from Sydney. Our corner of the world, the Pacific, have some of the most remittance dependent countries in the world, Samoa and Tonga in particular. Um, you know, you're looking at upwards of 25% of GDP represented by remittances, so incredibly important. There are, the banks are the last channel standing for remittances, but the banks are very, very expensive. So the money transfer operators are the small businesses that can do this business much more cheaply. But the banks have been putting the money transfer operators out of business in a process that the banks call de-risking. And the justification they give is that AML CTF rules, anti-money laundering, countering the financing of terrorism rules, they claim that their US banks, their US correspondent banks, want the Australian bank to have visibility on where the money's going, where, on the, where the money, on the, not only the money transfer operator, who is their client, a customer in Australia, but where the money's going in the recipient nation. And they claim that without visibility, full visibility on all of that, the US banks will not provide correspondent banking services for them across the board, which means basically they're out of business. Um, I say claim because there's no way to verify that. But what it means is if an Australian bank, and I'll speak more about Australia, I know people are on this call from all around the world, but I understand the market here better. And I think the issues are exactly the same. The highly rich developed country banks around the world have been putting money transfer operators out of business for at least the last five years. It's a problem in the UK, it's a problem in a lot of markets. And it's a ugly term de-risking because it's de-risking from the point of view of the banks it's certainly not de-risking from the point of view of the migrant workers it's not de-risking from the point of view of the recipient economies it's an increase in risk for them because what it means is the people who can move money relatively cheaply are forced out of the market and you're left with the banks and their fees are very high we between australia and the pacific are some of the highest remittance corridors in the world you can have 10 times up to 20 percent so, you know, if, if a worker from at some point in the past few years, people from Vanuatu have spent, had to spend up to $100 to move $500 money back to their village in Vanuatu. And if you think about it like that, it's really like banks arrogating the taxing power from the sovereign and taxing these workers directly. It's just exactly like a tax on the, on the transfers. And there's absolutely no justification for it. 
you know, and sometimes it's the same bank in Australia and in the Pacific. It's merely a book entry, but they insist on doing it through their old legacy software systems. They insist on doing it old ways. And because of course they do, because they like charging 10% in transfer fees. So it's, it's really a tax on development, which is why I've been interested in it for so long, because it's so mm. inequitable. A really interesting point there around the sort of legacy problems that banks face and, and where they route these remittances through. And I suspect, Miko, this is a great uh, time to bring you, bring you in. Um, Miko is the founder and CEO of Ayana, um, which is, he doesn't like me saying this, but it's a fintech startup. Um, but he'll explain more about what it, what it is uh, himself and he'll do a much better job than I can. Um, Miko is also, um, quote unquote, a reformed banker. So he straddled uh, both sides of the fence. So he has a, a social conscience, but he's he spent some time in the investment banking world. So he's a rare, a rare breed. Uh, Miko, question to you in terms of that concept around you know the traditional way of doing things is is slow, it's expensive, it's cumbersome. Um, how have you sort of approached that, and uh, and what are you seeing from a from an innovation standpoint around making this a, a better um, process for all? Well, thank you, Jerry. Thank you for the introduction and um, very nice to be, I'm happy to be here on this panel. So I think Badri uh, gave a very nice sort of a macro view of the, of the situation. Uh, it was bad then, as Ross put it, and it's worse now. And, but, and Ross actually also somehow encapsulated the problem that a, a lot of migrant workers uh, face in, in supporting their families in their home country. Um, I agree with Ross. It's been a, a actually quite, a, how would you say, a egregious system from, from the perspective of the migrant worker and the recipient. Uh, although I must say there's been some progress technology-wise from where I sit. Um, and um, obviously Philippines is, just to put some context, is the, if I'm not mistaken, the third largest recipient of inbound remittance in the world uh, every year. Last year, we we, remit, we received 34 billion US dollars, and that's been growing at like a three or four percent CAGR over the past several years. As more and more of our our of our of our Filipinos move overseas to work, not just as immigrants but also as guest workers, um, and uh, we've been in the business for 10 years. Uh, ever since I got out of banking, I decided to get into to this fintech, but uh, and uh, and we've seen sort of the uh, the the issues in remittance. In fact, that was the first uh, sort of transaction flow that we decided to focus our lens on is uh, as technology people and financial people. How do you solve this problem? Because uh, back then, I think ten years ago, on average, it was like twelve percent of the principal amount is what our sender would spend to send money home. I just realized now, and after seeing the ADB paper of Badri, that uh, it's even worse in some of these uh, smaller corridors, like between uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Tonga, and uh, Kiribati, and uh, Vanuatu. That's even worse, like 20%. That's that's really mm -hmm. amazing that those things are still existing. Uh, so yeah, so what's happening is globally, I think there are three trends. The big, uh, the big. Right now, the dominant sort of mode of uh, transfers is still through the banking system. I would say that uh, the vast majority still go through the banking system in spite of it being inefficient and in spite of all the, the forces, the competitive and forces that are making it harder for, for money transfer companies to do this. But the, the, there's been two innovations that have actually over the past uh, five, seven years to have that uh, kind of reduce the, the the friction is number one is of course the advent of smartphones and uh, and having more people in the developed world were in the sort of uh, the originating countries having access to mobile data and including migrant workers in fact uh, probably the first thing the migrant worker will get in Singapore or in in Hong Kong or uh, Dubai would be a mobile phone because they need it to connect with their families in their home country. And so that, plus the banks, of course, have started using mobile banking. So 
uh, that kind of obviates the need to actually walk to a counter, which is, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Hong Kong or to Singapore on a Sunday, but you will see a lot of our migrant Filipinos or migrant Indonesians uh, sort of uh, congregating around uh, the World Finance Center in central Hong Kong or the Lucky Plaza along Orchard Road in Singapore on their day off so that they can actually rip money through mm -hmm. the, money trans the mon money transfer services. So now with mobile banking, at least those who are banked among the migrant workers, have uh, they've been... Uh, relieved of that inconvenience of actually having to physically walk to the to the money transfer counter to to do the transaction obviously they're still at the mercy of the fees of the banks right so mm -hmm. the other next step is sort of uh, so there are these companies like in the us this called remitly uh and also zoom which has actually been around for almost 20 years it's actually a listed company on the nasdaq already just been acquired by paypal as well as let's say in Europe, there's TransferWise, or in in the in the UK, there's Azimo. Uh, so these are sort of non-bank money transfer operators that uh, that are making it easier again using mobile mobile devices. So actually, apart from the banks, the banks actually are in partners with the legacy money transfer operators. The two big ones are MoneyGram and Western Union. And Western Union is still a, a dominant player. MoneyGram. These are what you call the agent-based remittance players, uh, both on the origination side and on the recipient side. So they're like the, how would you say, the last mile, but the, the, trans the transactions are still cleared through the, the clearing systems of the bank, through the SWIFT system. So, uh, and obviously, I think when you mentioned 20% of uh, principal, it's normally because of these legacy rails, if you will, the dominant ones being uh, MoneyGram and Western Union. So the online players have actually slowly sort of like uh, eroded that that uh, so dominance of these legacy uh, sort of over-the-counter agent-based remittance players, uh, on the, particularly on the send side. On the recipient side, what I've noticed is that the it's the over-the-counter players are still persisting, partly because, mm -hmm. again, uh, in emerging markets like the Philippines or India or Bangladesh or Pakistan, again, the the uh, not everyone is banked, number one. Number two, not everyone has access to mobile data that is cheap and uh, reliable. So people still have the cultural habit of picking up their cash remit transfers from a, from a counter, from an agent. Uh, so I my the latest uh, data I got was at least ninety percent of global remittances, it's like close to seven hundred billion dollars, is still picked up over the counter in in the developing countries. So, so that's the part that still needs to be optimized. Uh, our company for money to flow between this uh, sort of like um, agent based networks. So. Uh, we realized there was a problem when it comes to cash liquidity or availability uh, in these last mile agent networks. So that's what we're solving by creating basically an interoperable system across this network. So we're creating sort of like a, in the United States, there's this thing called the automatic clearinghouse. So in effect, we're doing that. But instead of working with the banks, we're working with this um, um, uh, remittance operators. The other thing that's actually helping solve that as well is the rise of crypto. Although it's debatable how much uh, of, a, of a dent they've made in terms of uh, cutting down the remittance costs, but uh, there's the, the emergence of uh, these crypto rails that are basically trying to work around the SWIFT system. So I'm not sure if you've heard of a company called Ripple. Uh, they actually own 20% of MoneyGram now. So basically they're building uh, uh, alternative rails that are not uh, connected, uh, decentralized rails not connected to the SWIFT system. So these competitive pressures, technology at the same time, sort of competition is actually moving the cost of remittance down globally. From my understanding, from 12% of principal, it's now down to around 7% of principal. Again, that's on average. I'm sure there are corridors that are still very much, uh, very high, you know, uh, even in the Philippines. So, uh, so I, so technology, as Ross says, I think it's inevitable. Eventually, technology and competitive pressure will bring down. It's a, in a way, it's like a race to zero. 
it will probably settle down somewhere at the merchant discount rate of let's say two or three percent basically the cost of holding cash right mm -hmm. because eventually there's still going to be uh, some kind of settlement that goes on whether centralized to swift or decentralized to the uh, distributor distributed ledger systems and the cryptocurrencies um so i think uh, we can look forward to lower in, uh, remittance rates, making it more convenient and making it more cost effective for both the sender and the recipient. That's sort of uh, the view. Of course, that's a long term view. Meantime, we have a crisis going on. Uh, the pandemic basically exacerbated the, the, the problem. And uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done apart from technology to solve these problems that migrant workers face. Because if you lose your job, no amount of technology can help you send money back to your home country. Right. Yeah, Mika, thank you. There's, there's some really great themes in there that I'd, I'd like to kind of drill down on with the panel. The first is we talked a little bit about the, you know, the impacts of COVID, um, the impacts of going to a teller and the remittance in cash. Badri, have you seen anything in your papers recently around how much cash is actually being used now? Has that decreased? And Maybe, Mika, you've seen it on the on the front end. Have we, have we seen a significant decrease in the usage of cash in this system because of COVID? Uh, I think um, uh, this is a trend that is happening over time. Uh, not, uh, I, I'm not sure how much we can attribute to uh, COVID in particular. And uh, I think as Miko, Miko said, and also Ross mentioned, I think because of the changes that have been happening very quickly now, which are uh, like, a lot of examples that Miko gave are, you know, technologies that have been existing for a while, but they've been their use has been accelerated a lot in a short mm -hmm. time, and I think that is bound to have an impact on uh, usage of cash. Uh, at the moment, I haven't uh, looked at the data in detail, but uh, if you take India for example, I've uh, seen that over, uh, you know, the, a couple of years ago there was this experiment of demonetization of declaring. Uh, and notes to be defunct, and and uh, that 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 had a pretty uh, you know large impact on move towards cash. A lot of lot of street vendors and even uh, many 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 of the informal sector you know businesses and workers, uh, they moved to uh, uh, you know uh, transactions through technology. And actually, one interesting thing that I've seen in India, not in many other countries, you know, uh, even in US is that you can do transactions just by sms uh, messaging mm. texting and not you don't need you don't need, you don't you don't even need a mobile network you don't even data because almost mobile penetration has been pretty big there uh, but the data penetration right now is great but uh, one or two years ago it wasn't that big so uh, i think these kind of technologies uh, uh, as they evolve more and more uh, you know that can actually promote uh, uh, moving away from cash and going more in, in terms of digital uh, payments. And I think crypto has a big role to play, although uh, it's right now, um, you know, catering to a relatively small population because not many people are aware of it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's that's my overall uh, you know, observation on this. Uh, but I haven't seen the actual uh, data on cash usage in the recent past. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's a nice research question to uh, analyze and think about. Yeah. It's, yeah. uh, you know, uh, if I may add to Badri, uh, I think definitely uh, cash usage has decreased, uh, at least from where, from our, from what we're seeing. Uh, it's just that it's just, uh, okay, so over the years, it was really uh, uh, adoption of digital in, at least in the Philippines and in other emerging markets was maybe going like this. Uh, and then come first quarter 2020, went like this, psh, Mm -hmm. uh, and we see it in the way because we still run top-up centers for the wallets here in the Philippines. So the usage has increased be uh, definitely because of COVID. Now, however, we're basically just two quarters or three quarters into the pandemic. Uh, it's interesting now in my WhatsApp uh, uh, chat messages, I see uh, you know the people are reporting, the banks, the wallets are reporting increased usage of digital. Um, so, but the data is not quite there yet. I think it's a little early, but maybe after another quarter or so, we, we can establish really the trend lines. But definitely, uh, even in emerging markets, uh, digital solutions, contactless solutions are, 
are obviously becoming more uh, imperative. What I do, what I do see is sort of this the rise of what I call hybrid systems. Banks uh, are connecting with cash networks, so that um, you know, so that the people who used to uh, actually who for example, in the Philippines, the, the banks have been approaching us to connect to our sort of our remittance network. That seems to be a trend. So it's sort of like a still sort of a fidget, they call it a digital or offline to online sort of model yeah. where, where, where you still need this uh, cash rails, uh, these points of presence. Uh, but at the same time, yes, definitely, uh, unquestionably, there's been adoption of digital, not just in developed world, but more so in emerging markets. The, the acceleration is happening very fast in the Philippines. Right. Interestingly enough, uh, we launched a product last year before the pandemic, uh, which is basically a mobile POS system, a mobile ATM machine. It's an Android device that's connected to the ATM switch, the national ATM switch. So someone with an ATM card can go to, a, let's say, a fishmonger, or like a, anyone with a retail store that has cash on their till. And instead of drawing it from a from a from a, an ATM box basically it's the the store owner can dispense the cash from their from their cash register uh, and the adoption rate of that has been growing fast uh, I think because I think a lot more people are getting their uh, their funds through an ATM account uh, interesting enough across Asia ATM penetration is still quite low um, if you look at India, I think it's like 18 per 100,000 adults. Uh, Philippines is around like 28 per 1,000 adults. So even though um, uh, there's sort of like this uh, sort of, uh, how do you say, it's, I'm not sure who's going to win out, whether electronic wallet will take over and no one will need an ATM machine, right? Because everyone has uh, basically an ability to pay and to accept uh, electronic payments or it's going to be uh, uh, basically what's going to happen is you're going to have coexisting sort of modes of payment and transactions, either through the banking system or uh, cash to bank, bank to cash through ATM machines or or purely EMI or wallet type of systems. Mm -hmm. I think what's going to happen is these are going to coexist. Uh, in the case of India, because I'm, I'm very actively involved in sort of like uh, understanding the the fintech ecosystem in India, having friends at Paytm and Google Tez. Uh, yes, demonetization a few years ago gave the wallets a boost. But from what I gather, down people still go back to cash. So one of my friends who's based in Bangalore told me, in China, because it's a, basically it's an authoritarian system, basically the Communist Party says everyone has to use Alipay, everyone has to use uh, WeChat Pay, and you can't not comply, right? Or else they take you at the back of the courthouse and shoot you in the back of the head or something like that. But in, in a democracy, obviously, you have to have people people of choice. So I think in India, it, it's probably going to be more like that. Although across uh, Asia-Pacific, a lot of the banks are actually trying to now do real-time settlements, something that probably if you live in Australia, they take for granted because you have this EFT or whatever. But but in the Philippines and India, more so actually, uh, the Philippines is a little bit behind, but uh, India, Indonesia, they're already done a lot of the, the with the UPI and the Adhar and the re real-time uh, gross payments and even retail real-time. So. Uh, eventually, technology is taking the friction out of uh, of these transactions, particularly remote, you know, yeah. cross border transactions. Yeah, it, Ross. In terms of that that adoption curve and you know the innovation reducing the friction of these pain points, how far off are we from a from a truly digital world? Well, that's always the challenge, Jerry. I mean, I agree entirely with Miko that technology will solve the problem. But I think generally when it comes to technology, um, it's relatively easy to predict where we're going. It's very difficult to predict the timeline. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I listened, I listened to Bill Gates at the World Economic Forum in Melbourne in 
perhaps 2001 or something. And he was absolutely certain within three years, you'd be able to travel anywhere in the world with your mobile phone. You know, I could speak into my mobile phone in Manila and it would translate it in real time to somebody and they could listen to it in the local language. And of course, so he's, he was absolutely emphatic, we would be there by 2004. And of course, we're still not there, you know, but it's it's still right as a destination, we will get yeah. there at some point. I mean, yeah. the um, technology longer term will solve this for two reasons. We're moving to a world where uh, central banks will issue digital currencies. China is already doing that. In, they call it DCEP, Digital Currency Electronic Payment. They're trialing it right now in four major cities. And so they will have a digital currency, which will just be a normal renminbi issued by the central bank, but existing digitally. Now, this is a huge change because it's putting central bank money in the hands of ordinary people. And at the moment, the only central bank money you have on a daily basis is cash. Everything else you deal with, the way you pay your mortgage, the way your salary gets paid, all of that is done by commercial bank, electronic money, you know, commercial bank debits and credits. So this is a fundamental change. A number of central banks around the world have been working towards it for a number of years, but nobody's been willing to do it. Eventually, China has pulled the trigger. They haven't been willing to do it because it's such a big step into the unknown. But China's pulling the trigger for a number of reasons. But one of them is COVID, right? One of the things that pushed China across the line is COVID. The other thing that pushed China across the line is Libra, which is Facebook's proposed global stable coin, which is a private stable coin. So obviously, a private and a stable coin is just a cryptocurrency that's tied to something that makes its value stable. So the, earlier, the, the other panelists mentioned that cryptocurrencies, it's hard to know how much they're helping. Well, the big cost with cryptos is they bounce around like this, right? The value is very unstable. Whereas if you have a, a and the modern version of Libra, Libra 2.0, you'll be able to get a Libra coin a token in an established nation's currency. So it won't move any more than the Australian dollar or the US dollar. So on the one hand, you'll have central bank sovereign digital currencies. On the other hand, you'll have private sector currencies, stable coins. And either of those will largely, once they become available for international use, will largely solve the problem. But whether we we will get there in China domestically, I suspect, in a couple of years. We'll be there in Sweden in a couple of years domestically because cash is disappearing out the back door. Already two thirds of bank branches in Sweden don't carry cash of any kind. Um, so we'll get it in selected countries, but it, the question is when it will be allowed to be used internationally. But it will because these digital currencies will interact with trade documentation far better than our current payment systems. There's huge savings to be made. So eventually, I, th I think the whole remittances problem um, will, will be solved by either a government or a private sector stable coin. But be a nice person and don't ask me why. When? Because I'm not sure on the when. <laughs> I, I won't ask you when, but I might ask you, we talked a little bit about the adoption curve. And do you see an issue generally, and certainly, certainly in research that I've seen, you know, trust plays a huge part in a lot of the adoption of, mm. of what we're mm. talking about here. Yep. Um, it, how do we get around that? I mean, if we're talking about a predominant, what was a predominantly cash-driven um, remittance corridor, um, we've asked them to move to mobile mobile adoption, which for a lot of countries is now ubiquitous. Uh, we now ask them to skip that effectively and go to a, a cryptocurrency, which they know even less about. Mm. Um, surely that will have an impact on the on the uptake. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that will be one of the things that will really slow it down. But the flip side of that is that is why COVID is driving digitization in so many sectors, because a crisis is a good thing to get people over their cultural resistance to doing things a different way. Right. And, yeah. you know, I notice, you know, six months ago, I was really not very skillful at all on all these different platforms, you know, Zoom, WebEx and all the rest that my life now happens over. I've got a whole lot better in six months. Still not yeah. very good, but I'm better than I was. And um, it'll be the same with using these sorts of things, you know, when people are forced to. And the costs in some of the corridors are so high. Once viable um, alternatives spring up. Part of the problem in my part of the world, Miko was talking about these technological alternatives. 
the banks actively shut the accounts for any any entity that's trying to use that. They're really aggressive, incredibly aggressive. If they see any behavior they think looks like international money transfer, they just close the account with no, ex you just get a letter saying your account's closed. I know um, that from painful personal experience. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really <laughs> quite, it's, ex it's extraordinary behavior, which displays a complete and utter absence of any sort of social conscience. They do not see that they have any obligation to try to assist people in poor countries whatsoever. Um, it just doesn't register in their, on their radar. It's extraordinary to me. If but I make, maybe yeah. I can add a little bit of uh, sort of color into that uh, comment. Yeah. Um, as, long as, um, as long as you don't defend the bankers, Miko. No, 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 not at all. No, I, I'm, I'm a victim. Uh, basically, I had like my, we had like HSBC accounts shut down arbitrarily and, uh, yeah. you know, it had like hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in those accounts. And we had, it was incredibly uh yeah, it was so difficult just to get it out of uh, HSBC mm. and get it back to another account. I think part of the reason why that is the problem is because of the U.S. federal uh, government. Uh, a lot of these banks clear, since the U.S. Uh, dollar is still the clearing currency so far, as, as far as we, uh, so far, uh, is that a lot of these banks clear all these cross-border transactions through, through U.S. banks. And uh, because of, uh, you know, the U.S., whether for whether it's for good or for bad, no matter what, the, the the career of the New York district attorney actually is made if they can bust someone for money laundering or something like that. So these banks have taken a big hit. Mm. HSBC, Standard Chartered, they've been paying billions of fines. So they said this is not worth it. So they just mm. cut out anything that's cross-border. Mm. So yeah, it is a problem. I think you're right. The stable, the these uh, stable coins, or might be part of the problem. I think, uh, the, uh, or sorry, part of the solution. And there are a lot of uh, experiments going on, Celo, um, uh, Terror, etc. So XRP, yeah. Yep, yep. And part of, I think part of the issue, frankly, is a cultural issue. Americans don't send money home to the village. And they think the idea of immigrants or sending money home to support their families in a village is culturally foreign. It doesn't stack up to them. So they think yeah. there's something suspicious about any money moving across boundaries because it's not part of their culture. Well, uh, I guess that's part of it, but also, you know, you have to understand like uh, the, the, the biggest bilateral corridor for the U S actually is Mexico. And mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. That's also sort of the same corridor that drugs hmm. and human hmm. trafficking are going hmm. through. So there are reasons why they're very strict when it comes to anti-money laundering or anti... And, and of course, with 9-11, uh, obviously, the Patriot Act, they're very, in a way, these money, money rails are the ones that are funding some of these terrorist organizations. So, yeah, so it's... Uh, it's uh, uh, I, 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 warned, I warned you, don't become all balanced and reasonable on me, Miko. Now you're becoming all <laughs> balanced and reasonable. Well, yeah. So, but um, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, Mexico is the big, I think, uh, as a corridor bilaterally, that's the biggest source. And, mm -hmm. I, and I know that's the problem because of the, the drug trade. Um, also for the Middle East, because of 9-11 uh, and terrorism, they've really gotten strict. So, I think what's going to happen is more and more people will retreat from the U.S. banking system and move elsewhere. So even us, for example, we would like to open uh, clearing banks with banks that do not clear through New York or to the mm. U.S. Mm. because that's just it's just too much uh, pain and trying to deal with them. Yeah, and that's why I think yeah, yeah, I think exactly. that's why that, that's why China will let its digital currency offshore because it wants yeah. to take that business away mm. from America. That's Absolutely, a strategic imperative. Yeah. So, so Miko and Ross, I mean, these are, sorry, Badri, you had something to, mm. to add there? Or? Yeah, just, just a small aspect here. I think when it comes to trust, uh, I think there are two, two elements of that. Uh, one is the, the perceptive trust where, you know, people, uh, you know, accept these new things and they think this, this is going to work and so on. That's kind of a psychological thing. Another thing is the kind of an objective trust, which is, the very the, the all these movements of you know cryptocurrency blockchain this whole movement is about you know commoditization of trust right? trust trust is something like 
it's not a central thing trust is not mm. like uh, mm. uh, the central bank has to say that this is a currency and so on whereas it's it's decentralized and so the the whole um, um, uh, uh, you know the, the the trust has these two two opposing uh, effects on adoption of these technologies so one is it's actually people who really understand it they know yeah. that it's actually uh, uh, enhancing trust and others may think that it's it may not so that's one thing and the second thing is all, all these discussions that we had now uh, they also point out to another element which is the, the security of uh, transactions the cyber security and the the security threats that are involved uh although we have seen we have discussed that there's a flip side of being uh, you know proactive on or you know hyperactive on that uh, that that's what miko and ross are talking about mm. uh, also you know, I, i you know i personally have felt the other other side of it where you know uh, I, i do all my transactions online and then i realized somebody had hacked the account and you know uh, then it happened a couple of times and we had to close the account and so on so like at that point i was also thinking that what miko mentioned that there could be a coexistence when when these things happen the the trust element that i mentioned earlier that may lead people to think uh, think that maybe we should stay off stay away from all these things you know you know there are people uh, even now who say you know we should not have a smartphone like we should be away from technology and in that sense i think the coexistence probably will be facilitated by that part of the population which would say that okay whatever happens i'm not going to have an online account i want to go to the bank and get the cash so i think that is yeah. part of the reason why coexistence may be there in the future uh may, may i add to badri's comment uh you know what's interesting is uh there's been studies made that even in in developed countries like the uk or the united states when economies uh go into recession like what's happening now uh people tend to become more cash based because uh you know when you're you're when you don't have enough money to keep in a bank account there's no mm-hmm. point just keeping it in a bank account so my understanding like uh like in, in the UK you know when when there's a when there's economic slowdown there's a recession people tend to be more cash based uh they don't want to keep stuff lying around in a wallet right um um an extreme case in the philippines is that because it's actually not so much also what what mode of payment or transaction you use sometimes it's just not having enough money so some of the for emerging markets where you know there's still a, a lot of people below the poverty line that's a big issue several years ago we tried to launch a public transit uh card like a you know like a clipper card or octopus card or yeah. oyster card in the philippines and then we did some uh for the trains in manila and we did some surveys of people and they say you know what even if it's more convenient because i don't have to line up and get a ticket i can just tap it on the gantry and walk in the turnstile but for some uh, blue collar workers they just have enough money because they're paid daily uh that they only, they only have one money they only have cash for the for the journey to their workplace mm. and they have to wait until they get money from their employer yeah. so that they can go home so it's not even a question of of convenience yeah. it's a question of just not having liquidity so yeah, yeah so there are a lot of uh, moving parts here uh, and that's why i believe that uh, it's still be going to be coexisting that uh, maybe in some very wealthy countries like sweden uh, or small countries like singapore where it's easy to implement this or an authoritarian state like china you can you can create the, you can move entire populations into a digital realm but at least in, from where i sit in the philippines and from what i hear from my friends in other emerging markets like india or indonesia uh, i think cash will still be a part of the mix in one way or another maybe not as mm-hmm. dominant as before but it will coexist with the digital modes of transacting yeah, yeah i think you're right i mean there's a there's a there's a couple of great um sort of touch points on that badri your point around trust um you know we always one of my favorite sayings is that trust arrives on the back of a tortoise and leaves in a speeding ferrari it, mm. it's not something you can market it's not something you can build around it's something that you need to um to actually show it's you can only build trust by doing what you say you're going to do and doing it well um and that's something that banks consistently struggle with when they introduce any sort of new technology they need to show the value of it they need to show um that it is safe 
but it's a double-edged sword because you to your other point you don't want to talk about security too much because then it raises people's eyes around well why are you telling me it's so safe because you know is it not safe are you overselling this to me you know people are generally um generally pretty uh, pretty accepting of things um in terms of that the, the cash and the hybrid and, and where those things are going i think we will see you're right there will be a transitional period um it's not a binary sh uh, shift we're not seeing a binary shift for instance from branch based banking to internet based banking you know obviously with covid yes there's you know a restriction around what you can do in a branch um but i don't think when we see things open up again people will immediately stop just using digital. Those that like to use um, face to face banking relationships, remittance relationships will continue to do so. And as you say, Miko, there's a number of reasons for that. You know, I think the, the challenge around this, as you say, is there's, there's many moving parts. There's, there's a policy aspect to this. So what are the governments doing to, to help promote um, particular channels? And, and Ross, you touched on that uh, at the very beginning. There's a technology aspect to all of this in terms of how good is the technology? Does it actually um, service the need that's there at the moment um, and Nico I know you have a <laughs> have a vested interest in that and your technology is very good but um, you know how quickly can we get that across into the into the the source countries and the destination countries because it's one thing having it at, at one end of the pipe but if it doesn't get to the other end then that's not yeah. much of an issue as well the education uh, piece around all of this is is obviously a huge part of it um, I heard a great phrase um, in one of our webinars yesterday which was around edu action so it, it's not about education but actually you know talking to them about the how rather than the what so how they actually do these things rather than what they need to do um, and that's going to play a huge part in the adoption of all of this so that there's lots of moving parts there's lots of different elements that we that we can talk about you know maybe just as a final thought from each of you where where do you see the remittance world going in the next you know, six months, and then let's look a bit further and, and imagine a world in five years' time. Mako, I might pick on you and start with you. Sure. No, I certainly think digital. I mean, the the trans, the shift to digital is unquestionable. Um, although, of course, there are going to be constraints to sort of adoption, but definitely we see it that uh, more and more of these uh, migrant workers in the source countries will adopt these offline channels in order for convenience and for cost reasons um, and uh, it's up to basically the regulators and of course the the service providers to make sure that uh, that uh, the services are reliable and and, and cost effective um, so you know it's interesting uh, you know I, I've spent some time chatting with migrant workers in Dubai in the Middle East, it's actually a, the Middle East is a great place to learn about these things because uh, there's a joke that if you throw a rock in a shopping mall in Dubai, you're going to hit an Indian guy, a uh, Pakistani guy, or a Filipino guy. Most likely, it's going to be a Filipino guy. There are more migrant uh, guest workers in Dubai than there are locals, actually. So, so it's a great place to learn about this particular type of personal cash remittance. And, and they're actually, the, the migrants are very savvy. Mm. They're very savvy. You know, uh, they would make great forex traders because <laughs> they're so uh, particular about the spread that they will mm. calculate down to the fourth decimal place the conversion rate because they want to get the best deal for their hard-earned mm. money because mm. they work their butt off cleaning toilets and they need to send this back home. So they want to get the right. best deal. So um, so uh, they're pro if I were the banks, if I was running a remittance company in uh, of course, if it's a monopoly, uh, there's no there are barriers to entry. Obviously, the banks have a, a great way to rent seeking, as uh, Ross puts it. Uh, but uh, but if there's a way to remove those uh, uh, that ability to get rent, uh, the 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 senders themselves are the be the best source of uh, feedback on how make how to make the the uh, the the service more more. Uh, how do you say, effective, uh, removing the friction from the system. So, but it's going to happen. It's going to take a while. I'm excited about the uh, crypto and uh, stable coins and digital currencies. I, I think uh, I agree with Ross. Eventually, all central banks around the world will build their own digital currencies eventually. Uh, and that's basically to stave off the 
the and maybe by then the the value of Bitcoin will go down further. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, but uh, yeah, but I think that's that's where it, it will be in the next. Uh, maybe by the uh, by you know it's interesting. Like a country like Japan, a big chunk, more than fifty percent of transactions are still in cash. You'll be surprised. Yeah. For a, for the second largest economy, well, maybe third largest economy in the world now, it's still uh, interestingly how cash has, has persisted. So I think the jury's out. So I'd rather straddle, as Ross puts it, and have one leg on the cash system and another leg on the on the electronic system. Yeah. Beautiful. Ross, final thoughts from you. Yeah, I agree with Miko. Technology is going to solve the problem. The question is how many years before we get there. What we need in the interim, I think, is a whole lot of pressure on governments to put pressure on banks, to support money transfer operators, to support the interim solution. And the challenge with that in a country like ours, Jerry, is that Samoans and Tongans and people from Vanuatu don't vote in Australia. Mm. It's terribly difficult to get Australian government people to take this these issues seriously. But I'd also echo what Miko says. I, it was a time I did a lot of work on mobile money in developing countries. And in a lot of these countries, these people are so savvy, they travel with three SIM cards in their pocket. They'll swap from one provider to another provider at 4 p.m. because the other provider's rates go marginally cheaper. And yet these are the people that the rich country banks are effectively taxing on their hard work when they try to send money home. It's extremely unattractive stuff, and our governments have a moral responsibility to respond, but whether they will, difficult question. Perhaps for another webinar at another time. Badri, your final thoughts, and it sounds like you're probably going to have to go back and do some more modelling based off all of this, so I'm sorry about that, but uh, <laughs> and that's what you like doing anyway. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, it's always interesting to explore what is happening. I think I completely agree with, uh, you know, Miko and Ras on the, on the, first observation that, uh, yeah, we are going to gravitate towards more uh, digital, uh, you know, digital currency, digital payments, uh, and so on, and less cash. Uh, how much, uh, what will be the proportion, when it will happen? It's, uh, again, it's, it's open. Uh, and I think, but there are a couple of other things I want to mention. Uh, one is uh, the, the changes that are happening now, uh, some of them uh, could be long lasting. Uh, for example, a lot of migrants may return to their home countries, so the need for remittances itself uh, might might you know come down a bit over time, uh, or it may even bounce back if we have a good solution, and if you know things change. In uh, I don't see things changing in a year or so, but at, at some point, if things change, maybe people will you know travel more and migrate more and so on. It, like you know this rebound effect when things are really bad and then they get better, then and the demand will double double what it was before. Right? That, that, those kind of things can happen, uh, but but at the moment I see that is another factor in terms of how much like what Ross and Michael Miko mentioned and how much uh, pressure is going to be on the government on the banks to you know fix these things. Also depends on how much demand is going to be there uh, uh, in, in this mix of things happening. Uh, you know people going back and and I think. Uh, Another another uh, trend I see in countries like India and uh, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, and so on is that we we have this larger uh, uh, global value chain recalibration that is happening, and a lot of industries are moving from uh, you know China to some of these countries, and that is creating more employment opportunities, more industries, and so on, uh, and that is also that also might absorb some of these migrants who are coming back. Uh, I think these are these are some other elements, some other you know macro economic elements that might play uh, into the into the motivations and incentives of the policy makers and the bankers uh, to adopt some of these technologies so i think that that's one uh, observation i have yeah okay well listen i think we're uh, we're bang on time um thank you all very very much for your contributions i think uh, what we can all agree on is that who knows what's going to happen in the next six months. So we'll probably just have to do another one of these in six months time and, and revisit where we all are. But uh, my takeaways from this, are look out for the Perez Buckley global cryptocurrency and uh, we'll all be trading in that in the next six to four months. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, listen, thanks very much for your time, guys, uh, to the audience and the, and the questions that were sent through. Thank you very much for all of that. Uh, I hope that was uh, helpful. I hope that was informative. 
And uh, with that, I think we'll end it. Um, Marika, Vanita, if you want to come back in and wrap Should we up. do a screenshot? Thank you so much. That was so fascinating. I love the Ross Perez uh, currency. <laughs> Fingers crossed. That's something that will be real. Some final <laughs> words, Mariko? Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you all uh, to all the panelists and Jerry for moderating. Uh, we really appreciate your time and all your thoughts today. Uh, really, really informative and um, a great discussion. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll, Thank see you. You. we'll see you Thank soon. You. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>